<laughs> this, uh, this is the same genuine, magic, authentic crystal used by the priests of Isis and Osiris in the days of the pharaohs of Egypt, in which Cleopatra first saw the approach of Julius Caesar and Mark Anthony and, uh, and so on and so on. Now, uh, you, uh, you'd better close your eyes, my child, for a moment in order to be better in tune with the infinite. We, uh, we can't do these things without reaching out into the... For a moment, moment, moment. You better close your eyes, my child, for a moment in order to be better in tune with the infinite. For a moment, moment, moment. You better close your eyes, my child, for a moment in order to be Specific foresights delivered to Marty in the form of this magic manuscript enable him to open a stargate through the fabric of space-time, which arouses our suspicions as to the nature of its acquisition. It becomes strange when we realize he obtains it in front of this, the Eye of Horus, often intimately associated with mankind's ascension process or mankind's connection to otherworldly high intelligences. Thus it becomes suspicious when it takes such a profound interest in essential events preceding Marty's transdimensional adventure. We might even infer that the Eye of Horus was responsible for giving Marty the key to opening his time travel stargate. The ascension process, as well as the Eye of Horus, is often intimately associated with the pineal gland almost exclusively associated both etymologically and optically with the pine cone. Marty McFly graciously interacts with the pine cone, or the word pine, by sitting on top of it, just before receiving his stargating scripture. Here he is, sitting on top of the word pine, about to be contacted by higher intelligences via the Eye of Horus, via his pineal gland. The pineal gland is also called the third eye, which is very convenient because directly in front of him are the words the, third, and then a picture of an eye, or the third eye, which appropriately foreshadows his polymorphous pilgrimage and strengthens the sync association of interdimensional travel as a third eye involving process of spiritual ascension. Not content at merely overseeing the events of that day, these otherworldly higher intelligences return to again meander the backdrop of Marty's manuscript acquisitions. With his third eye submersed in a rainbow, Marty ventures to the now revamped but geologically identical storefront to again obtain future foretelling scriptures from mysterious extraterrestrial forces. You see this book? This book tells the future. The information in here is worth millions. Grays, sports, almanac. Grays, sports, The Greys have also been intimately associated with the Eye of Horus, two symbolic equivalents to higher consciousness or higher intelligence that Marty happens to interact with. Take special note and consideration of how the word Greys is surrounded by stars, further eliciting the celestial nature of its associated entities, the Greys. Something very strange happens as Marty is first introduced to the book. This book that is brought to him by Greys is surrounded by stars and is being handed to this Stargate quester. 
At the very moment that it first touches his fingertips, it becomes completely surrounded by images that document humanity's most profound initiation into interstellar travel or cosmic endeavors, Apollo's missions to the moon. As if to foreshadow Marty's own personal journey into the non-local, extraterrestrial realms of existence. The operative alien representative word, Grays, in fact makes direct contact with the most iconic of the Apollo photos just at the moment Marty is receiving the book for the first time. The time machine is quite literally an advanced spaceship from another dimension, and Doc Brown, as perceived by the peoples of the era, would be an advanced human being operating a UFO from another dimension, quite literally. Thus, we tunnel, the Griffith Park Tunnel. In Lloyd R. Christbearer Part 1, we introduce the theme of the tunnel as being a metaphorical representation for experiencing the world with limited perception, reaching the end as being representative of significant quantum leaps of understanding. We noted Christopher Lloyd is consistently positioned at the tunnel's exit to be dramatically discovered by distressed protagonistic tunnel goers validating his candidacy to represent the light or the truth that is carried by higher consciousness or higher intelligences. Let's not forget previous sync associations of holy man Christ bearer Lloyd to substratospheric messianic force Jesus Christ and God of all gods Mount Olympus's Zeus which fits ever so nicely as Marty travels in fear down the tunnel of limited perception to be saved by the light, the Christ, Zeus, interdimensional higher intelligence, UFO operating, Christopher Lloyd. Steal my stuff. Keep in mind that Marty's whole purpose for being in the tunnel in the first place is to reclaim the Gray's alien manuscript from Biff. He has lost his connection to the alien high intelligences, and once he firmly reestablishes his connection with the Gray's by reclaiming the manuscript, a UFO appears at the end of the tunnel and abducts him, ever so appropriately reinforcing the sync link between interdimensional pineal gland induced travel and contact with higher consciousness representing extraterrestrials. All right, Arnie, let's find Jennifer. I don't believe it. I live in Hilldale. This is great. Way to go. Marty, right. stay here. Change clothes. If I need you, I'll holler. Oh, come on, Doc. I want to check out my house. We can't risk you running into your oldest self. Come on, Arnie. In a brief time-traveling stint of his own, Biff, clad in checker pleats, is escorted to the wormhole car in a ridiculously over-checkered checker cab that adorns the word Luxor. A quick Google image search reveals a puzzling and unmistakably obvious association of the word Luxor with celestial contact-evoking Stargate monuments originating in ancient Egypt. 
and being intimately connected to Eye of Horus powers also associated to Marty and stargating. The Eye of Horus delivers Marty the essential ingredients for opening a stargate, while this night sky illuminating Egyptian pyramid escorts Biff towards the same stargating fate. Be careful, old timer, there's a rough neighbor to see. Right here, here it is. Biff's only encounter with time travel is not just accompanied by the Stargate Pyramid, but also happens to come immediately after he finds the gray alien representing Sports Almanac. We can observe the intuitive connection between traversing tunnels, entering wormholes, walking into the light, and alien abduction, all interchangeable representative elements of the non-local journey of spirit, and all experienced by Marty culminating at a particular tunnel of great interest. Most curious indeed is the Griffith Park Tunnel and Christopher Lloyd's affinity for loitering near its exit. He does not merely star in movies featuring this tunnel, nor does he even merely interact with the tunnel. He always plays out the same story of being found directly at the tunnel's exit. In one instance, by a man chasing after a white rabbit accompanied by the Scarlet Woman, operating a checker cab down the rabbit hole towards salvation. The very same rabbit hole traversed by Marty while pursuing the alien contact almanac which he happened to first discover on display here, adjacent to stargating paraphernalia, the same white rabbit being pursued by our other Christopher Lloyd discovering Griffith Park Tunnel adventurer. Marty is being told to pick up the book and follow the white rabbit. Strange how we have Marty standing before two items that have both been used to lead to Christ at the end of the Griffith Park Tunnel. Marty, whose first supernatural contact episode was with the Eye of Horus, is now saved by Christopher Lloyd below a spirit of Horus representing Egyptian obelisk, which is the cornerstone to the landscape design of the Griffith Observatory, which rests directly on top of the Griffith Park Tunnel. Lloyd's tunnel consistently syncs with embarking on the non-local spiritual journey, and it was actually built in order to access an observatory of the heavens that houses a monument honoring the spirit of Horus. The Spirit of Horus Tunnel is also featured momentarily in The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension. Dr. Uh, Buckaroo Banzai, perhaps you can explain yourself. The film begins as Buckaroo is going to pilot the world's first interdimensional traveling car, much like his Back to the Future counterpart, Marty McFly. Banzai shows up fashionably late due to the fact that he is in the middle of performing surgery. May I have the curved diacetyl, please? It's not here, Dr. Banzai. Uh, let me have the straight one then. Dr. Banzai is using a laser to vaporize a pineal tumor without damaging the quadrigeminal plate. Subcutaneous microphones. Dr. Banzai is using a laser to vaporize a pineal tumor without damage. Pineal, pineal, pineal. Dr. Banzai is using a laser to vaporize a pineal tumor without damaging the quadrigeminal plate. Of all of the surgeries that he could brain surgery on the pineal gland. Another strange parallel to Marty McFly. After interacting intimately with the pineal gland, he pilots mankind's first successful interdimensional journey, helping us draw the same conclusions about pineal gland-induced ascension that we saw displayed in the epic of Marty McFly. Highlighted on Banzai's car is the value 88, it is overtly plastered on the hood, doors, and license plate. The car itself is even named the HB88. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. When this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. With many questions to be answered, we jump to a scene where Banzai begins pursuing this white van. 
that features a haloed mountain or stargate type logo. And he ends up chasing the van through the Spirit of Horus tunnel. The very same tunnel that Marty chased the Grey's alien almanac through. Inside the van is one of the parts that allows his car to function properly and travel hyperdimensionally. Without it, he cannot open wormholes. So, you see that we have two men traveling through the Spirit of Horus tunnel, both striving to reconnect with higher intelligences or with their ability to contact higher intelligences. Marty must reclaim the gray alien sports almanac so that the alien UFO, operated by Christ Lloyd, will connect with him, while Banzai must get his hyperdimensional car part from the van with the Stargate logo. The kicker is that the van with the Stargate logo at the end of the Spirit of Horus tunnel is operated by Christopher Lloyd, playing an alien. I got to cough up the crucial missing circuit, and then we finally get our butts off this rock. What? Uh.